Hello everybody. Um, today we're looking at how to learn software. Every single musician who works with software at some point will have to learn some new program, some new version, some new door, whatever. Today I'm going to be giving you my top tips for making that process quick, simple and easy to manage because there's ways you can massively cut the amount of time it takes to get fluent, to get up and running and I'll be showing you how. But first of all, over to my clone who is somewhere else. Okay, so I've come here to Seville in southern Spain. This incredible weather, this stunning, splendid architecture, unbelievably beautiful food. And the only reason I'm here is to explain to you how to use software. Honestly, really, seriously. For no other reason I would come to Seville in southern Spain, okay? I'm going to be explaining to you the route planning um, way of learning uh, software. And a city like this uh, gives me a really good analogy. <laughs> Was that analogy or excuse? Hmm, not sure. Anyway, come back in a bit and I'll explain how it works. And we'll be back with him in a little bit. But first, realistic expectations. Obviously, it's going to take time for you to get up uh, and running on a new door. If you're transferring from one digital audio workstation to another, um, then you have an enormous advantage to, uh, compared to people who are starting from scratch because there are certain conventions, there are certain things which are pretty much the same on almost all doors. If we look at Logic here, for example, there is a tracks window, so you've got all the instruments down one side, you've got time which goes from left to right up the top. If you had, um, for example, a piece of MIDI in there and you double clicked on it, you would open an editor. These are, par these are sort of paradigms which the designers of the software know that you understand and so that they work around the same way so it's quicker for you to get up and running. And this is a sort of an evolutionary, convergent evolution thing going on here where people have worked out over the course of time, this is the best way of doing it. Now, there are some doors which work very differently and that paradigm doesn't apply, like FL Studio, and those become harder to acquire. And if you're moving from those, from FL to Logic, Cubase, whatever, then again, slightly more complicated. But the paradigms which user experience designers use um, are really designed to make life easier for you. Realistic expectation, if you're starting from completely from scratch, you should be able to get something working in your door within an hour or two. To be able to get to a point where you're sort of functional, where you can actually, you feel, you know, you've got some idea what's going on, will take a week or two weeks. To get completely fluent on a piece of software so you know really where it's going is probably going to be more like a year. If you're moving from one door to another, you can expect the whole process to get sort of professionally fluent on the new door, if you were already on the old one, to be about three months. I moved from Digital Performer to Cubase, which is my main door, and that took about three months before I was at sort of professional working level. So I ran the two um, in, in parallel and it worked absolutely fine. Um, so that's just managing your expectations because when you do this, it's obviously gonna take quite a lot of hard work. And that's really what we're looking at today, how to cut that hard work and make things most efficient. Now, as my friend in uh, Seville was saying, my approach to this is very much looking at it as root finding, essentially. Um, I'm not trying to learn the whole piece of software all in one go. I'm trying to base it very much on tasks, how to get from one part of the software to, an, to the other. And with that, let me hand back to my bearded friend in southern Spain. OK, here's the analogy. When you first get into a piece of software, it's really easy to get completely lost. You have absolutely no idea where anything is. There are sort of menus and sub-menus and contextual menus and everything else. And within seconds, you are completely lost. The places you need to be, you have no idea how to get back to them. And that's very similar to a city like this, beautiful as it is. It's an absolute rabbit warren of these tiny little alleys. And unless you've lived here all your life, it's really, really easy to get lost very quickly. So how do you learn your way around a city like this? Well, the truth is most people go around with Google Maps finding, finding their way from one place to another. But there is no Google Maps for software. Bad news, I know. OK. So what you do, what most people do, is they say, OK, where's my hotel? Where's the cathedral? And I learned the route from one to the other. Then you go, Where's the restaurant? You learn the route from the cathedral to the restaurant. And that, in that way, you gradually build up and start filling in all the details on the map. And before long, 
you start crossing here, there, everywhere, and the map starts to become um, something which looks like knowledge of how the city works. Software is exactly the same. In other words, you don't sit down and read the manual as though it's a novel. The Cubase manual is the best part of 1,500 pages long, which means it's, uh, it would make Anna Karenina look like you know, a Sunday supplement or something like that, which is obviously not. So you're not going to read it cover to cover. You're going to use it as a work of reference. That's what it's there for. So you learn the roots to the things you really need to know. You make notes and you use the manual. But actually, there's an even better way. Can you imagine if teleportation was a real thing that I could go, take me to the cathedral and I disappear and end up at the cathedral? Unfortunately, teleportation is not a real thing. Yeah, bad news for Star Trek fans. It's science fiction. Shock horror, okay. But in the world of software, there is such a thing as teleportation. It's called keyboard shortcuts or things like that. And we're going to go back to the shed and I'll show you how it works. Okay, so what he was talking about when he's talking about teleportation, obviously key commands. Now, key commands, it's hard to overestimate how important they are in terms of making your software journey much simpler. Um, they can... You know, they can be combinations of almost anything. Um, if, for example, uh, you're on a Mac, it'll be a combination of Shift Command N, or it'll be um, Alt Command J, or you know any of these things. Or you've got the F keys up the top, and you've got the number keys down there. So there's okay. There's lots and lots and lots of different um, variations. But what this allows you to do is you don't have to sit here going, oh, which tracks menu was it in? I can't remember where it was. You just go, you cut straight to the chase. Um, in Logic, uh, if you go to uh, the menu, here's key commands, go to edit, and you will now see um, all the key commands set out for you. And you can search for new ones and all the rest of it. So what I'm recommending you do is when you start with this root finding method, which is basically rather than learning the software, you learn it by trying to do tasks, okay? So you say, right, how do I create a track? How do I put create a virtual instrument? How do I record into the track? Write it all down. But better than that, rather than saying, ah, uh, it's that menu, tracks menu, then in this, that, that, find the key command for it, and then write that down. Because once you're able to go, poof, you'll be flying around the software in no time. So in order to learn that, you're gonna to have to come in here and if we want to say bounce to disk, uh, we just type bounce in here and we'll find out what the key command is. And there we go. Um, bounce tracks in place um, is um, that control uh, command B, uh, for example. Now, really important, there are in this huge list of things quite a lot of um, commands which are only available as key commands, okay? And so what you will find is that some things, and some of these are incredibly useful, um, um, are only available if you set up a key command for them. So in order to get up and running quickly, you're, you're writing this long list of key commands and all the rest of it. And the ones you use most often are the ones you're gonna have to either memorize or, next big tip, you use something like this. So this is a stream deck. Each of these buttons here contain, is, is linked to a key command. So the stuff I use all the time, like show and hide tracks, bounce, normalize, drop a marker, um, nudge, go to left locate. I've got these all set up on here so that I just have to hit the button. I don't have to remember the key command. Now, Stream Deck is not a cheap piece of kit. Um, there is a, a mobile version, which you can run on a, on a phone or a tablet, which is much less expensive. But also remember, if you want to use key commands, there are other ways of setting it up. Most keyboards, for example, like this one, have buttons at the top, which you can assign to all kinds of things. You may well be able to assign those to key commands as well. But if, you know, in the long and the short of it, if you can't, um, uh, if you don't want to spend money on the Stream Deck, then just remember, the, remember to write down the key commands. If they're really obscure key commands and it's something you use really often, then reprogram them so that there's something to use easily. But if you're, this is a word of warning. If you're coming from one door and going to another, don't 
try and reprogram all the key commands in your new door so that they match the ones in the old one. Because sooner or later, you're going to have to reset the, set the thing, you're going to have to install it on a different system, and you'll be stuck because you won't know the default key commands. You'll only know your customized ones. So if I were you, take bite the bullet, get stuck in, learn the key commands, and things will get much better. So what is it? Okay. What is it about learning software that people have learned? It's a bit like a language. If you've learned one language, foreign language, then the second, third, fourth become easier and easier because there's certain ways you go through it. You, know, you have a process. Learning software is very, very similar. So when I see a new piece of software, um, you know, the first thing I'm going to start doing is, for, is using what are called um, contextual menus. I'll see what happens. If I go control click, what's going to happen? I get a whole list of commands coming up here in the middle. Let me just show you what they are. Uh, so there you go. So now, however, if I do that, uh, if I control click over here, I get a completely different list of command. That's what's called contextual menus. In other words, it depends on where you click, what menus you get. So there's loads of functions which are buried in these contextual menus. And pretty much the first thing I'll do once I've found my way around um, is start looking at stuff like that to see what I can do. Um, it is fair to say that um, when you first start working on a new door, um, that it, you are bound to be disappointed and it is bound to be frustrating for a good reason. Because what you're going to be doing, if you've come off Studio One or something, you're going to Logic, um, that you will be trying to take your workflow from one and trying to impose it on another machine. And sooner or later, you're going to bump into something which this uh, second piece of software just doesn't do. And, or doesn't do as simply, and you'll go, ah, damn, what, ah, etc. And so you think, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Because what you're doing is, just because you're applying your old workflow to the new door, you're discovering the bumps in the road rather than the brand new things, which this does, which your old system didn't do. So sometimes you're going to have to rethink your workflow to work with the strengths of your new door, not just trying to imply uh, 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 impose an old working regime on a, a new piece of software. Okay, but it's um, it's always worth getting over that first hump because the first hump it can be so frustrating the first few days, and you'll go, why am I bothering to do this? I'll go back to the old one. There's a reason you're doing it because normally there's some fundamental problem with the old one. It's getting slow. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. You've got to stick with it. You know, it's like, um, you know, if you move to a new town, you don't know everybody. It's a bit miserable to start with. But within a couple of weeks, you've got lots of mates. You're going down to the sort of the Morris Dancing Club and you're boom, 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 you know, all this. And before you know it, it's all happy. OK, stick with it because that's what's going to happen to you. So just to recap, have realistic expectations. This is going to take weeks, months before you get really uh, properly engaged with uh, the software and able to um, get going with it. Use this kind of root finding method. Don't, you know, don't read the manual cover to cover and expect to remember it. Set yourself tasks which you know you want to achieve and then work out how to do them. OK, and then gradually all the tasks will start um, meeting up and go, actually, do you know what? I think I'm getting it. OK, key commands. Key commands are everything. It is it is the, the software uses superpower. OK. And write down the ones which you need to use most of all. If they're not set up for your workflow, adapt them so that they, they are. Because the key commands are the things which will make your working life so much simpler. And really investigate the key commands preset list because most large doors have tons of facilities and tons of functions which are only available if you set them up on key commands. <laughs> okay. Um, Use contextual menus, get used to right clicking, control clicking to see what's going on and expect ev wherever you click, if it's on a MIDI file, if it's on a piece of MIDI, a piece of audio, whatever, expect it to be different. And then you write down, oh, that's where I get to how to quickly process audio or whatever. And you write it down, that's where it is, or that's the key command or whatever else. Um, and that is pretty much it. I mean, the more you do this, the easier it gets. 
Um, and there's so much wonderful software out there. Uh, knowing more than one door if, if, is a really good thing. You know, because obviously Ableton and FL Studio do a completely different job in many respects to Cubase and Logic. So get both. You'll find you write different music. You'll find it inspiring and fun, you know, because actually once, once you get over the hoop and the, the hump, you've just got more choices, okay? So look, go out there and have fun. Enjoy it. I hope you found this useful. And I'll be back very soon with some more stuff. Okay, bye.